Good morning, Professor. Good morning, Sir Brian. You can see me? Yes, I can or see least, you and hear you. Uh, most of me, I hope, and you can hear me. Uh, yes. Now, uh, you're at home, I, I think, with your wife. Yes. Um, uh, and uh, you're, you're on your own at the moment, are you? Uh, uh, where we've set up the, um, the, um, the system, yes, I'm in that room by myself. Now, let me tell you who you're, you're talking to. Uh, it's Fleet Bank House. Uh, here we have a room which is big enough uh, for 200. We have at the moment uh, eight people in it, uh, all of whom, bar, bar one, are wearing masks. Um, and that one is Miss Richards, who will be asking you the, the questions in a moment or two. Uh, names you will hear uh, are Mary, who will ask you to take the oath in a moment or two, uh, and Schumick, whose job it is to make sure that any documents which uh, we want to refer you to can be displayed on your screen uh, and to the public generally. The public generally, uh, there were yesterday uh, just under 250 uh, people watching. There will be very similar numbers, I think, today. Uh, they are watching from various locations uh, around the country on a, a mixture of uh, YouTube uh, and live stream. And they're the people you're really talking to uh, when you're giving your, your evidence. Well, without more ado, uh, I'll ask Mary to ask you to take the oath. I need to get a uh, Bible, do I? I yes, guess. you do. Wait you a do. second. Please state your full name. Uh, Howard Christopher Thomas. Take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Professor Thomas, can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Now, you are a Emeritus Professor of Hepatology in, in, in the Department of Medicine at Imperial College London. That's correct. Um, uh, prior to that, I'm not going to go through the full details of your career, um, but from 1974 to 1987, uh, you worked at the Royal Free Hospital teaching, undertaking research, and involved in patient care. Is, is that right? That's correct, yes. And then in 1987, you took up um, a post as the Departmental Chair of Medicine at St Mary's Hospital Medical School. Uh, and then at some stage after that, you became Head of Hepatology and Gastroenterology at the Imperial College Medical School before retiring from that post in 2011. Is that right? That's correct. Now, you've been a member of multiple working parties, committees and advisory groups detailed in your witness statement. I'm not going to ask you about uh, to list them, um, but we'll touch on some of them in the course of your evidence. You gave evidence to the Archer Inquiry and to the Penrose Inquiry. Yeah, is that correct? Yes, yes. Uh, and um, you were then director of the Skipton Fund um, from around late 2012, early 2013, until 2018, and a trustee of the Cacton Foundation from 2011 to 2018. Yes, that's right, yes. Now, I'm going to ask you, first of all, today about the Skipton Fund and the Caxton Foundation and your involvement with both of those bodies, and then I'm going to ask you, after that, some more general questions uh, relating to your work in hepatitis, your involvement in some, some of the working uh, parties and, and, and groups. Perhaps I should say in relation to the Skipton Fund, uh, when it became a company, a limited company, then I was a, a director. I think there were three or four of us, uh, but, but I wasn't the director, if I could yes. <laughs> emphasize that. Yeah. Yes, yes. You were one of a number of directors, and our understanding yes. is you were the first medical director. That is right, Miss Richards. Yes. And then you were joined um, in, in that role by Professor DeShaco uh, two or three years later. Yes. Um, now... 
then, as I say, I'm going to start with the Skipton Fund, but I'm going to ask you about your involvement at a much earlier stage. So a number of years before you became and one of the directors, uh, you had some early involvement in the uh, setting up of the scheme. And if we could look at SCGB four zeros two six five underscore zero zero four, please show Mick. So we can see, Professor, this is um, headed ex gratia payment scheme for people infected with hepatitis C as a result of treatment with NHS blood and blood products, meeting to discuss the medical trigger point for the proposed higher payment, 14th of October 2003. And then we can see who's present, a number of uh, um, uh, uh, medical uh, uh, clinicians, including yourself um, at Professor DeShaco, uh, and then a number of representatives of the Scottish Executive, the Department of Health, um, and the National Assembly for Wales, or Senior, Senior Medical Officer, I think that must be, National Assembly for Wales. Uh, and then if we look at, just a little further down under the heading, preliminary discussions, um, we can see in paragraph one, it says, following items one and two on the agenda, introductions and background to Scottish scheme, the experts were asked for their initial thoughts on the medical trigger for the second higher payment. Now, before we look at um, some of the discussions uh, in this meeting, um, can, can you assist us with this? Uh, how was it that you came to be involved uh, in uh, this meeting? Well, uh, uh, I've been appointed, um, well, initially, I think in 1987, I was the, uh, a member of the advisory group on hepatitis. Um, and uh, then um, I think in um, 1999 to 2009, I was the chairman. And I presume that um, uh, since I was already involved with the Department of Health, um, they, I was one of the uh, named people that they, th think, uh, they thought might be able to help. Um, and in particular, um, uh, a, a lady called Anna Locke, who was an American uh, research fellow who was working with me, um, had written a paper um, uh, describing how one could um, determine whether somebody had cirrhosis, which was one of the main trigger points for uh, the payment of the stage two, uh, the stage two level. Um, uh, they thought that um, we might be able to throw some uh, some light on that particular aspect of the of the organization of the of the um, Skipton, and particularly the transition from stage one to stage two payments. Um, so I think that that's why I got involved. Um, now, um, we'll, uh, as we've seen from the, the, the heading on the document and, and, and paragraph one, the meeting was specifically looking at the trigger point for the stage two payment. H had you been involved in any of the wider discussions about what the shape of the um, Skipton Fund should be, or, or whether payments should be made on an ex gratia or compensatory basis? No, I, I was just brought in um, with the other people that you've, you've got at the heading of this uh, uh, paper um, as people who could provide uh, medical uh, information, particularly hepatological information, um, on, on when somebody had cirrhosis, which was going to be one of the main trigger points. And that was chosen as a trigger point, by the way, for, for the larger payments, is because uh, up until people um, have cirrhosis, um, many are asymptomatic, or we thought at that stage, many would be asymptomatic, and uh, cirrhosis brought with it uh, uh, all sorts of um, um, symptomatic problems and also change in life, life expectancy. D did you, through um, your, either through your involvement with, with this, um, this group, or through your more general involvement with the Department of Health, um, gain any understanding of why it had been decided that the Skipton Fund would be set up on a national UK-wide basis? And no, I, I really was uh, only involved in the, this focused issue, really, of, of um, you know, why this was stage two and how, we, how could we determine when somebody had cirrhosis without doing a liver biopsy. Um, so if we then look at the terms of paragraph one, uh, it says um, 
uh, in the third line, it was felt that this, the medical trigger for the second payment, should be a recognised stage of the disease rather than subjective symptoms of illness. Uh, can you assist with why that was the, the view of the, the experts? Um, I think it was, we were looking for objectivity really, uh, something that would um, allow whoever had to implement this uh, with a, a solid um, breakpoint really when you move from stage one to stage two. Uh, I think that was the main reason. And then, um, sorry, carry on. And uh, uh, later on actually, I, th that, uh, I think you have some uh, evidence. Uh, I was asked to um, provide uh, a document um, on really the equivalence in terms of symptomatology and life expectancy uh, between stage one and stage two of hepatitis C and HIV, uh, the stages of that, uh, which you and you've got that in your documents later on. Yes, yes, and I'll also come on to your involvement in in what became known as the special category mechanism as well. Um, That's right. Yes, um, and I should emphasise that you know at, at at all stages I, I was doing research in this area, and as as I published papers um, that showed that our initial. Uh, views may not have been 100% correct, and this was the case with the SCM when we realized that some stage one patients did have problems of, uh, um, of, of depression and also um, a, a, a cognitive abnormality, which we showed was related to an, an infection of the brain. Um, and I'll, again, I'm going to come, come on to those. Um, and then we can see the, the next sentence of paragraph one, all agree that the trigger point should not be left until too late in the course of the disease as in the late stages, patients might have a very poor life expectancy. Is that the reason why uh, the trigger point was not limited to liver transplant um, or cancer, but included cirrhosis? Yeah, very much so. Um, and there was one other thing that was included uh, at this sort of um, uh, earlier stage before you, you, you had a uh, chance of developing uh, uh, liver failure and liver cancer, and that was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, which, which was, was one of the um, objective um, determinants of, of a stage two payment. Now we can see this if we, sorry. So th this is a tumour of the lymphoid system and also requires quite a lot of uh, additional uh, therapies of one sort or another. Um, now we can see in paragraph two, um, um, then the discussion alights upon cirrhosis as the most practical trigger point. And then there is a discussion about um, uh, uh, reluctance to make payments contingent upon liver biopsy, particularly for patients with haemophilia, um, and so a, a desire to explore the possibility of using non-invasive tests as a viable alternative. Um, and so if we then go over the page so that we can follow through the discussion. Paragraph five under the heading non-invasive tests um, uh, uh, um, refers to a range of hematological and biochemical tests. Not, I'm not going to go through each of them, but there's, there's a list, I think, appended to this document. Um, and then halfway through that paragraph, it says this. Although there were, these were commonly performed tests, there appeared to be limited experience in using various combinations to predict accurately the presence of cirrhosis in clinical practice. Uh, however, there were a number of scientific papers that sought to validate particular combinations of these tests in patients with chronic hepatitis C that could be used as a basis for determining the optimum combination of tests. So could, could you just assist us a little further in understanding the difficulty there and the reference to there being limited experience in using various combinations to, to predict cirrhosis? Well, uh, this wasn't a uh, problem limited to uh, the haemophilia population, but they did have a particular problem because of their... Um, uh, failure or the inability to the, the blood to clot, uh, but it was a common uh, problem with all cirrhotic patients who had uh, coagulation problems. Um, and uh, as hepatologists, we really didn't want to do biopsies unless uh, absolutely necessary. And Anna Locke, who, as I say, was um, had been a fellow with me, uh, and I think by this time had gone back to um, the United States to take up an appointment had written a paper uh, which was essentially uh, describing the APRI test, which was um, 
a, a computation um, of um, of a, an AST, which is a measure of liver cell damage, and a platelet count, which is a measure of um, how large the spleen is, uh, and is a measure of portal hypertension, which is invariably found with uh, in patients with cirrhosis. And th these two tests together um, were thought to be the best that was available. But um, it, depending on uh, the level at which you, you set um, the trigger point, uh, and um, Dr. Locke and, uh, and subsequently this committee decided that that would be a, a figure of greater than two um, when the AST started to go up and the platelet count started to go down. Um, then um, the AST divided by the platelet count would give what's called the APRI score, and that, um, if you set it at two, would be 91% specific. In other words, you it, you didn't pick up people um, uh, without cirrhosis, uh, and um, it, the sensitivity, however, at this level was was um, uh, uh, not ideal. That was about um, I think 50% or something like that. Um, and that was the reason uh, why we combined that with the AST over the ALT, uh, because when you have cirrhosis, uh, although both of these tests measure liver cell damage, uh, the AST goes up um, higher than the ALT uh, when you have um, cirrhosis. So we combined um, these two tests, uh, which is, is, the, is now mentioned in the um, document when people apply for stage one or stage two uh, payments. Um, and it, it explains specifically the levels which uh, will, um, will indicate that somebody has cirrhosis. But even so, it, even with AST and ALT added to this APRI score, um, there, there were some uh, people who would have cirrhosis and wouldn't be picked up by these two tests. So we said uh, that the physicians or, or nurses looking after the patients could add other data, which might include um, scanning of one sort, uh, ultrasound, CT, and, and then latterly MRI scanning, or endoscopy when you can look down the patient's throat uh, to see if, um, if they have varices, which are an indication that the patient has portal hypertension, uh, which is always an indication or invariably an indication of cirrhosis. You could add in these uh, to make a, a better platform. Um, and I think um, over, over time, this was quite a good combination of things. Um, most of the stage two um, payments were not uh, appealed by the, um, by the um, appeal group later on, if which is not the case with stage one, of yes. course. Yes. And then if we look at paragraph seven, so paragraph six refers to the combination of non-invasive tests and, and, and thresholds, as, as you've just described. And then paragraph seven says, a hepatologist or other clinician familiar with the patient, their circumstances, and medical history should be able to advise patients who've not undergone liver biopsy whether on the basis of the panel of chosen tests there were grounds for seeking uh, the second payment. Uh, and so it, it would appear that, that the expectation of this group was that um, this was going to be a judgment for the hepatologist or other clinician who was actually caring for or familiar with the patient. I is that right? Yes, and it had a function uh, uh, in addition to triggering a stage two payment, and that was related to the fact that patients, when they have cirrhosis, uh, are at risk of primary liver cell cancer. And between two and four percent of people with cirrhosis irrespective of what it's due to, so it could be due to hepatitis B or hepatitis C or alcohol uh, or indeed uh, now obesity-related fatty liver. Uh, any patient, particularly males, who develop cirrhosis uh, because they have this risk of developing primary liver cell cancer should have um, um, yearly ultrasounds to try and pick up the tumours at a time when we could resect them or we could um, um, uh, 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 suggest the patient to go forward for lipid transplantation. So w we were looking for something that was integrated into the general um, mechanism of pair of, 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 of mechanism of care of patients, uh, but would um, because it was being done for these routine 
uh, issues around the patient's care could also be used to trigger a stage two payment. Um, and then if we look at paragraph eight, um, it appears that the, the, the group within this meeting um, uh, recognised there might be a small number of cases where a panel of simple and readily available tests might not provide a clear answer. Uh, and in those cases, is this right, there might need to be further testing. Um, there's reference to the fibro test. Is that what we now understand to be the fibro scan, or is that something different? No, it's something different. This was something that the French had come up with, which <coughs> they were um, selling via the web uh, as a way of, um, uh, uh, for the patients, and indeed the, the physicians looking after the patients, uh, to tell whether they might have cirrhosis. So you filled in um, certain bits of information, uh, <coughs> clinical information, and uh, you then, uh, with a fee, could get the hyaluronic acid or, or the other blood tests done, which would say you have a so much a probability, such a probability of having cirrhosis. We didn't like that very much because what we wanted to do was have something that was um, didn't uh, involve patients uh, going through additional tests. Uh, it would be uh, it would use information that was being routinely collected for the care of the patient, um, as I've already said, uh, so that should they have developed cirrhosis, we could uh, start ultrasound screening for primary liver cell cancer. So we weren't very keen on these additional tests, except the ones that I mentioned earlier, which were also tests being done routinely in British units, uh, you know, such as various scans uh, and, uh, and uh, endoscopy where there's a fibro endoscope put into the patient's stomach to look. And this would be done routinely uh, for, for patients. And that latter test, of course, was a way of, um, of seeing whether the patient did have varices. And there were uh, ways then of preventing the patient having a variceal hemorrhage, which was a catastrophic uh, hemorrhage um, and very disturbing for the patient. So we wanted to know if patients were at risk of that uh, so we could uh, give them drugs to reduce that risk. And, and lastly, um, um, yeah, I've got the, whenever I used to lecture, that we were always told, don't, don't say you're going to make three points, because by the time you got to the third point, you couldn't remember what it was. This was general recommendation to lecturers at Imperial. So I'm sorry, I've forgotten the third point. It's, it's equally applicable to barristers, um, Professor, so don't worry. If we go to the top of the next page... Um, we can see the very top line, it said it was also acknowledged that a group of experts might need to be available to adjudicate in particularly difficult cases. So would it be right to understand that the scheme as envisaged by this group was that the vast majority of cases would um, uh, uh, turn on um, the, the opinion of the treating clinician, um, but there might be a, a small category of, uh, or small number of particularly difficult cases where a broader range of expert opinion might need to be sought. Yeah, basically that's it. And, uh, and in the period before, either myself or or um, Jeff Jashaker were um, formally involved, uh, because uh, I had been involved um, through the advisory group on hepatitis and then this group setting up the, the issues around stage two, um, Nick Fish, um, who was the administrator for the trust, uh, would be able to um, uh, really um, sign off on a, on a series of patients about stage two payments because these um, uh, APRI scores and the AST ALT ratio, supported by other clinical information, were sufficiently robust um, that um, th this information was on the application sheet. This meant the majority would just go through fairly rapidly. And then um, uh, before I became a director, uh, Nick would ask me uh, to uh, to help with individual cases if if it, it wasn't uh, um, if the payment couldn't be triggered on the on the data that was on the sheet really, but the clinicians looking after the patients would would provide the APRI score and the AST ALT ratio uh, and say also which additional tests the patient had done and and then uh, say uh, I think he has cirrhosis or she has cirrhosis sign off it uh, sign off it on it. And then this would flow through the system um, without um, delays for people like me or, or Dr. Chuseko getting involved. Um, 
if, if we then look um, uh, at the heading discussion of item four, clearance of hepatitis C virus, there's then a discussion about um, whether there should be included within the scheme or not those who spontaneously cleared and those who cleared post-treatment. Now, can I ask you first of all about those who, who spontaneously cleared? We've also had them referred to as natural clearers. Um, what, what's recorded in paragraph 10 is it was agreed that a patient who remained PCR negative six months after the virus had first cleared spontaneously, and then I'm gonna leave aside treatment, was highly unlikely to relapse during the course of their lifetime. This was thought to be the case in 98% of cases. Um, and then um, if we just look before I ask you a question about that at paragraph 12, we can see experts agreed that people still had a very small chance of developing liver cancer following, and again, I'm leaving aside successful treatment, following spontaneous viral clearance. Um, uh, uh, now, the, um, the, the scheme as th that was set up did not include those who had spontaneously or naturally cleared the virus um, uh, uh, um, in the way described here. Um, what, what, what was the view of the expert group on that issue, as far as you can recall? Well, I think there are two types of patient who would be identified um, with antibody um, and a negative um, uh, PCR. Uh, if I could um, just remind people that the antibody indicates that there has been infection um, and would be positive in continuing the infection and also in those who'd cleared it. Um, whereas the PCR um, does uh, detect the continued presence of the, the virus. Now, the, the group that uh, once, if somebody's been infected, then um, 20 or 30 percent of those patients will clear the virus within three to six months and that group um, the, in that group the liver will go back to completely normal normality and they are not at risk of, of liver cancer uh, the group um, that that uh, I think is being alluded to here is a group who unbeknown to the patient and sometimes unbeknown to their physicians because they may not have been under a physician's care um, they they may have um, moved on to chronic infection um, and one percent of those is the guesstimate uh, that may then after many many years clear the virus they still have antibodies so they're in the group that's being talked about here and if they have already developed cirrhosis albeit uh, having cleared the virus uh, if they have already developed cirrhosis then they will be at risk um, of about 1% per year developing liver cancer. You know, if you still have the virus when you have cirrhosis, then it's about 2 to 4% develop liver cancer every year. If you've um, developed cirrhosis but have cleared the virus, either spontaneously, uh, and a few people do that every year, or on these modern treatments, which are virtually now 100% effective in, in clearing the virus, even if you um, clear the virus, but you've developed cirrhosis, you will still be at risk uh, of developing primary liver cell cancer. But it drops to about 50% of the incidence uh, of what you would see if the patient uh, is still having uh, the presence of the virus. Uh, did I manage to explain that okay? Or um, y Yes, I, I, I'm just, can I um, just ask you first of all about the category of, of um, of those who, who do naturally or spontaneously clear the virus um, uh, within a, a six-month period. Right, yes. Um, the, the, um, the decision was taken uh, to exclude that category from the, the scheme, the Skipton Fund. Um, w was any consideration given either at, at this meeting or, or to your knowledge at, 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 at any other meetings to the potential psychological consequences, the anxiety, the stress, the fear that that category of patients might nonetheless experience? Um, uh, at this stage, I think the answer is no, and particularly with that group who cleared the virus in three to six months. Uh, later on, um, uh, 
when we had been using interferons for a long time, for instance, which are, um, you know, are clear only at about 20% of patients with chronic infection uh, of the virus. This, this causes uh, quite long-term uh, symptoms. Um, uh, and uh, that was the reason, having observed that, um, in, a, in other words, uh, once patients had had interferon treatment for treatment of the chronic infection, they would have continuing uh, problems. And that was the reason why uh, I, I thought we should um, think about having um, an additional payment in stage one uh, patients uh, and why the SCM came about. But it brought with it, as you'll see later, um, a lot of subjectivity, really. Uh, yes. But that, that introduction later on of, of, um, of um, an SCM um, payment in stage ones was recognition that, uh, of what you're talking about. But the acute infection, uh, which is people who cleared the virus in the first three to six months, uh, we believed then, and I think we probably believe now, um, uh, that that group returned to complete normality uh, once they've cleared the virus. That doesn't mean to say they haven't had concerns uh, during the three to six months when they've been infected, but after that phase, they should, if they've been um, properly reassured by their physicians and nurses, uh, they should return to normal uh, or the pre pre infection stage, we thought. C can I then ask you just a little more about what's said here um, about the position of patients who have cleared the virus following treatment? Um, if we look at paragraph 13 under the heading financial assistance for successfully treated patients, it says there followed a short discussion on whether people who'd successfully cleared the virus after treatment should qualify for the initial payment. Experts argued both for and against this, um, and then there's a reference to a patient um, possibly having waited a considerable period before receiving treatment. And then paragraph 14, during this time in the treatment period, the payment patient may claim they'd suffered and therefore that they should receive financial assistance. However, this is also the case for a huge number of everyday NHS patients who do not qualify for any assistance. The danger of treatment becoming a disincentive was also highlighted experts recognise that this should ultimately be a policy decision. Um, can, can I ask you to assist with two matters, Professor? The first is the reference to the danger of treatment becoming a disincentive. Um, w w was it a, a genuine concern that patients would not go through treatment for what was a very, very serious condition simply because they wanted to obtain financial support? Um, well... I think at the time, um, uh, I don't think we knew anything about uh, what would motivate people to do one thing or another. But later on, of course, this became a very important issue in so much as uh, with the current drugs that we have, uh, a three-month course of uh, antivirals clears 100% of patients. And uh, in the last years of the scheme, um, th those of us involved in it often saw patients who had um, applied for um, an ex gratia payment um, after having cleared the virus. Um, and um, uh, whereas, you know, they at that time, we thought they should have returned to co complete normality unless they had had interferon at, at the earlier stage where we know now, uh, and we we're becoming aware of, at the stage that I'm talking about, um, that, that the interferon could, could, could induce autoimmune diseases, it could make rheumatoid arthritis worse, could make um, a thyroid condition worse, it could also um, make depressive problems worse, uh, to the extent that uh, in my unit we used to refer patients, uh, or we had a psychiatrist working with us uh, who often gave um, antidepressive treatment uh, before we started interferon treatment. Uh, because we knew that there, there could be problems in, during the period of the treatment and afterwards. So I think the bottom line is it, it changed um, after we'd seen what interferon treatment was like. Um, but before then, at the time when we were discussing these issues, we rightly or wrongly thought that when patients had, um, had cleared the virus, uh, then they should return to their pre-treatment, pre-infection stage. Um, and that should be... Um, relatively normal, unless 
uh, they had uh, there was knowledge that they had problems before, uh, such as uh, anxiety or, or depressive problems. So, um, I mean, this was uh, an attempt at a pragmatic approach, I suppose. The the the, the paragraph fourteen also um, uh, says in the uh, sentence before the one that's highlighted, this is also the case uh, for a huge number of everyday NHS patients who do not qualify for any assistance. Um, did the expert group or the, the, the group holding this meeting not recognise that this cohort of patients might be said to be in a very different position from everyday NHS patients because this cohort of patients had been infected by the NHS? <laughs> which won't be the case for everyday NHS patients. No, I appreciate that's another, another factor. Um, um, we were, um, um, you know, not only thinking of the haemophilia uh, patients, uh, we were also um, trying to provide recommendations for the majority of people with non-A, non-B or hepatitis C. Um, um, and I should uh, mention here that... Uh, about 80 to 90 percent of people with hepatitis C virus infection had acquired it by mechanisms uh, other than uh, by NHS blood or blood products. Um, so, um, and uh, in addition, um, the, uh, there was a great deal of complexity around those other than the haemophilia population who had acquired the uh, infection as, as a result of a blood transfusion. Uh, usually um, for treatment of a malignant state. Um, so I think it was extremely complicated, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and uh, we couldn't come up with a, a, a group of um, 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 criteria that were uh, suitable for all situations. And uh, the, the ultimate determinant of who got... Uh, Excretion payments, of course, was was the Department of Health, uh, and then up to the the minister. Um, you'll you'll know uh, that the, the Skipton was in fact a body which um, received money and a set of ru rules um, on how to um, uh, distribute that money. Uh, you might, would rightly say that I and uh, three or four other people were involved in setting up the rules, at least for stage two, um, and. Um, that's the case. So we would take responsibility for those rules that were stemming from the stage two um, policy decisions. Um, but the sort of issues that you're talking about became more of an issue uh, in stage one, where uh, not only um, um, the issue about um, uh, you know how how much um, people's lives had been disrupted by uh, these infectious agents, um, and HIV was added in there as well. Uh, there were those issues, but also issues about insurance, uh, all manner of things. Um, so we tried to come up with um, with a set of rules that could be easily um, easily be uh, interpreted. Now, just to complete the picture um, about this, these early discussions, there's a second meeting to discuss the medical trigger point in January 2004. Shamik, that's at DHSC. Three zeros four four two five underscore one five nine. Um, we we can see there it's the second meeting, twenty seventh of January, um, and the attendance there set out, in, including yourself. Um, I'm not going to go through the the detail of it, but if we go over the page. and we just look at paragraph four, um, you, you've referred already to, to Dr. Locke. Is, is, is that the, um, what you're, is being referred to here, the work that had been undertaken by Anna Locke? That's right. Um, and the two tests that ultimately were uh, on the um, application form for stage two payments were the APRI score and the ALT-AST ratio. Uh, and it explains um, uh, there what the trigger points are what the APRI score should be greater than two and the ALT-AST ratio should be less than one if cirrhosis is present. Um, and that, that really had been uh, tested um, uh, by Dr. Locke in a prospective way. In other words, once she had decided that this uh, 
might be satisfactory, then she looked at it uh, in a group of patients who um, were going forward uh, for liver biopsies. She would then, for other reasons, to determine what sort of liver disease they had, as, a, as opposed to the severity. Um, she would look at these tests and see how they correlated with the, um, the liver biopsy, which was the, um, uh, the gold standard, if you like, for, for cirrhosis. And then so we... yes, there was that that that, that uh, AFRI score and the AST ratio is is what was taken forward into the forms, and the um, physician um, or, or the nurse uh, filling in the form with the patient um, would mention these. And if if they were positive, um, and they had already been um, uh, they had already been receiving a stage one payment indicating that it was accepted that they had uh, been infected. From NHS blood or blood products, then that uh, Nick Fish, I think, would automatically have passed those through to uh, for payment. And I think we can see that. Of the medical people. Sorry, so yes, and if we, I think if we go to the next page, paragraph fifteen, we can see that process. I think that you described clearly. Envisaged there. So paragraph 15, under the heading, whose responsibility? In the first instance, it was suggested the patient, patient's clinician, should initiate a claim. Uh, if not by biopsy, this would require submitting the application form, presenting the clinical information from the tests to the Skipton Fund. If the results were clear-cut, um, and then we see the, the criteria there set, the claim would be validated and authorised by the fund. Uh, if not, a medical panel would consider the results or perhaps commission a poignard fibre test. If still inconclusive, it's envisaged the medical panel would review the case. Um, so that, I think, is what you were describing was, was the group's understanding of how the system was going to work. Exactly. And then if we just look at the very bottom of this page, under the heading, in the other business, paragraph 19, it says, following the tabling of the press statement that announced the details of the Skipton Fund, Dr. Gian Grandi and Professor Bassendine both expressed disappointment that the scheme had not been extended to dependents of those who had died. Um, uh, had you been involved in any discussions about whether the scheme should or, or, or shouldn't include dependents? Well, somewhere along the line, and I can't remember whether it was the Archer or the Penrose that I'd also been involved with, uh, it, it did seem that this was an important issue, um, that, um, and particularly uh, in the haemophilia population where, uh, because it uh, can occur sporadically, but it's obviously gen genetically determined and affects males, um, this, you know, and often, uh, except... Uh, in today's world, it's probably no longer true. The male might be the um, the, uh, uh, the the person supporting the family. Uh, it was, it, you know, if, the, if that person died, then it would leave the family in terrible situation. So I think uh, we also shared um, the concerns that Maggie Bassendine and I don't know Dr. Uh, Gian Grandi, but I do know Maggie Bassendine, who worked with me for a long time. Um, I shared her views. Um, no, had, sorry. I think it had been mentioned uh, in the Penrose, had it not? Yes, that was rather later. Right, yes. Um, it's difficult when I was involved in all those things, those two or three things, to remember what was decided at what situation. But I think there was general agreement of what Maggie Bassendine said there. Um, now, I'm not going to go to the document, but following um, this meeting, I think that you were coppered into some emails, as, as were the other members of this group, that looked at the design of the form. Um, uh, um, um, did you, after that, so that, that was in early 2004, we know the Skipton Fund became operational in July 2004. Um, did you, after that, have any ongoing involvement with the Skipton Fund, other than uh, such approaches as, as Nick Fish might make to you about individual cases prior to your appointment as a director? I can't remember the temporal sequence. I was trying to do that this morning and trying to find out uh, what Nick had said, actually, uh, because I, I, I thought I'd been involved um, before um, 2011, which is uh, the point when I... Uh, well, no, I think it was 2012 I was actually appointed to be a medical director but I've got a feeling I was involved in individual cases before then. Um, but um, 
certainly my formal arrangement uh, came after I was appointed to the, the, the Caxton, which I think was 2011. Yes. Um, and it soon became apparent that I didn't have a big contribution to make there uh, because I, I, it was more um, um, the Department of Work and Pensions and these sort of things. And I gave a, a talk to the Caxton at the beginning on, on some aspects of the history of um, and, the, and the main problems in, in uh, hepatitis C. And then I, I uh, was invited to become a director of, um, of the Skipton uh, in a formal sense. Um, but I cannot re remember where the break point is, uh, but I'm pretty sure um, uh, I, I was involved before that, actually. But uh, Nick Fish ought to be able to tell you that. Uh, um, so when I came, but the formal involvement was on in, in 2011. Um, again, I'm not proposing to take you to, to, to individual documentation relating to this, but I think it's also right that you provided witness statements for the Department of Health um, in response to two separate judicial review challenges to aspects of the Skipton Fund. One, I think, in around 2010, um, when uh, there was a, a challenge about the, the, the position of those who, who, who had cleared the virus, and you provided a statement. And then I think later in 2017, you provided a witness statement for the Department of Health um, in a challenge that looked at the comparison between HIV and, and hepatitis C. Um, is, is that correct? Yes. I, I certainly remember the second one, um, uh, trying to compare um, hepatitis C with HIV, yes. I can't remember too much about the earlier one, to be honest. I'd need to see those documents again. Uh, um. I, I wasn't proposing to ask you any questions about it, Professor, oh, okay, but it may right. explain why you had some uh, um, recollection of some, some um, other involvement. Um, just then want to turn to just 2012, um, and, and this is shortly before you were, I think, uh, um, became a, a director. If we go to F SKIP, sorry, get the reference, um, four zeros, no, SKIP five zeros, three zero, underscore zero, one, one, please show me. This, these are the minutes of a meeting of the Board of Directors of Skipton, 26th of March, 2012. And if we go a little further down the page, under the heading Matters Arising, it says, the scheme administrator, so that's Mr. Fish, reported that the expected increase in borderline stage two applications had occurred. As a result, a meeting had recently taken place with Professor Thomas, a world expert in hepatitis C and liver disease during which a collection of borderline claims had been discussed. The meeting had been extremely useful and resulted in a decision being made on each case to either approve, decline or write back to the applicant for spe specific further information. The meeting had been useful in pinpointing biochemical trends which were indicative of cirrhosis as well as other symptoms which are significant when assessing the likelihood of advanced liver disease. When borderline claims are received in the future, the lessons learnt from Professor Thomas would be applied with the option of referral to him if there is any doubt. Um, there's then a discussion about um, fibre scans, or transient elasto elastography, uh, and we can see one of the directors, Mr Spellman, um, asks if there's a recognised trigger at which a fibre scan reading was indicative of cirrhosis. Uh, the scheme administrator responded that a reading of 15 was accepted as being 90% indicative of cirrhosis based on information provided by Dr. David Mutimer, a leading liver specialist who's also a member of the Independent Appeal Panel. The board requested that this reading be double-checked with Professor Thomas. Now, I'm going to come on to the fibre scan trigger in a, in, in a moment. Um, so uh, if we just leave that aside um, for, for a moment. C can you recall anything about the broader discussions as to how to deal with borderline claims that, that you and Mr. Fish appear to have had, uh, and, and in particular what's said to be biochemical trends indicative of cirrhosis and other symptoms? Well, yes, I mean, um, other than the APRI score and the ASTALT ratio, um, I mentioned earlier that if someone has cirrhosis, then blood has difficulty flowing through the liver, which makes the spleen become larger. 
and then the spleen takes out of the, uh, of the circulating blood platelets. Uh, and so when somebody has cirrhosis, the blood uh, uh, can't go through the liver so readily. Um, all the blood from the intestine, I should say, and from the spleen goes up through the liver. Um, uh, but if, if that uh, flow is impeded, the spleen gets larger, the platelets go down. Um, and either a low platelet count um, or endoscopic evidence of uh, and endoscopy is where you you have a, a fiber optic uh, scope pop down into the stomach uh, where you can see the lining of the stomach if the if there is portal hypertension difficulty in the blood going through the liver then the veins in the in the lower uh, esophagus and, and stomach uh, are distended so that is uh, evidence um, uh, of portal hypertension and invariably indicate cirrhosis. So that would be one set of observations that would, would also um, lead to cirrhosis. The fibrous scan um, was um, a, a mechanism whereby <coughs> um, you put a shearing impulse into the liver through an ultrasound probe and you look at how, how much the, the, the liver wobbles, um, much as a jelly, um, you know, or, or um, um, would would wobble if you if you shook it, uh, <clears throat> and a, a normal liver would wobble quite a lot, uh, whereas one which has cirrhosis would become stiff and wouldn't wobble, uh, and that was the basis for the the fibrous scan. Um, I think later on, and you may be coming to this later on. I think I thought that we we should have a, a lower score. Uh, than than fifteen, I think was it twelve or something like that. I'm, I'm going to pick uh, that up uh, with the next document we look at, um, Professor yeah, Thomas. I thought that fifteen. Uh, what what David Mutimer was uh, thinking really was that he wanted to get the um, the, the specificity up up high. In other words, uh, he didn't want to um, uh, misdiagnose cirrhosis, uh, but uh, that would mean when you increase the specificity, then the sensitivity goes down. So I thought we, we would be better and fairer to the patients if we set it at a lower level, where we, we would let some people through who didn't have cirrhosis, but were probably very near it anyway, uh, and uh, we wouldn't miss many. So that, that was uh, that, that uh, component of the other tests. Uh, the other things that happen when you are near to cirrhosis is that the liver, um, as well as releasing um, transaminases, that, that's the ALT and the AST, which normally should be within the liver, and when the liver cells are damaged, leak out, so the blood levels are higher. The, those, um, those tests only tell you about um, um, whether there's ongoing liver damage. Uh, but the liver also makes coagulation factors, albumin, uh, and a whole host of other proteins. All the proteins in the blood uh, are made in the liver. So when the liver uh, shrinks in size, which happens with cirrhosis, then the albumin particularly goes down. The coagulation factors also become abnormal, not, not helpful. In, uh, still helpful in the haemophilia situation because there are ones which aren't uh, abnormal in haemophilia, uh, but are reduced when the liver size is reduced by cirrhosis. So those three main groups of, of things, portal hypertension, evidenced by endoscopy, um, uh, stiffness of the liver uh, as measured uh, laterally by a fibro scan, and the uh, inability of liver uh, to produce the blood proteins because of um, a reduced liver size um, would be other bits of information that might, might make us think. And in particular, the physician or the, or the nurse uh, helping the patient fill in the form um, uh, might might put in there to convince um, the, the skeptic that, that this was a case of cirrhosis and should trigger a, a stage two payment. And if we look at um, a, a meeting the following March, we can see the issue of the fibre scan um, being picked up. That's SKIP 5030 underscore 085, please show me. We can see this is the 11th of March 2013 meeting of the Board of Directors of the Skipton Fund. Uh, you're present, and we can see from the first paragraph, welcome to Professor Thomas. The Board welcomed Professor H. Thomas as a director and looked forward to his expert help. So this is the 
um, this is the first meeting, as far as we can understand it, that you attended as a director. And then if we look towards the bottom of the page, we can see there the issue about Fibroscan being returned to. The scheme administrator referred to the Fibroscan reading that was considered to be indicative of cirrhosis. And then there's reference to, to Dr. Mutimer's view, which we looked at in the previous set of minutes. Um, and then reference to um, a medical bulletin having been submitted, taken from the Hong Kong Medical Diary, which suggested a reading of 12.5 um, or over as an indicator of cirrhosis. And then this records you citing a NICE study into the effects on the liver of hepatitis B, which suggested that 10 or above was an indicator that cirrhosis might be present. It was agreed that due to the range of differing opinions, all transient elastography readings of which Fibroscan is one brand would continue to be considered along with other test results and markers to determine the likelihood of cirrhosis, borderline applications, would be referred to Professor Thomas for his expert opinion. Um, so that appears to be the way in which the, the issue of a, a fibre scan um, reading was, was addressed at that stage. N no absolute cut-off point one way or another, but not reliance upon or not requiring a reading of 15 or above. Is, is that right? Yes, and I rapidly thought when that responsibility descended on me of who else I could get to be involved. And that's where I thought it would be a good idea to get uh, Professor Jashaker involved because uh, I think it, when it, there are, you know, when it's marginal, it's good to get uh, other people's views. And, uh, and that's why I got uh, the, the, the board got uh, Professor Jashaker involved as well because he was equally well informed in this area as I had become. Uh, and then. There's one further discussion about fibre scan readings I want to ask you about. Um, uh, it's a couple of years later. SKIP 5030 underscore 068. So we can see these are the minutes of the meeting of the Board of Directors of Skipton, 10th of March 2015. And you're present as um, now is Professor DeShaco. And we can see... Um, from the welcome to the new director and finance manager that this is Professor DeShaco's arrival on the board of directors. Um, if, if we then go to the bottom half of the page, um, there's reference uh, to, um, uh, under the heading matters arising, uh, um, if we just look at the paragraph that has the number 165 next to it, it says the scheme administrator reported that since the fund had greater board level medical expertise, the success rate at the more recent appeals panel meetings had been less than the overall average of circa 50%. It was agreed that the appointment of Professor DeShaco meant it was no longer deemed necessary to appoint another medical director, especially as there was often good medical data published online to assist with applications where records of a medical procedure were provided, but not specifically that referenced treatment with blood or blood products. Um, now, that's obviously concerned with, 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 with um, the stage one process. But it, 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 was it your understanding that fewer cases were being uh, 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 overturned on appeal because of um, your uh, um, um, and then Professor DeShaco's involvement with the stage one process? Well, I think we, uh, uh, yes, in short, but I thought we had a bigger effect uh, on um, well, I mean, there, there was already um, very few, few um, um, cases uh, uh, of stage two um, refusal overturned by the um, appeals panel, I thought. Uh, and that was because that was highly objective in, in the way that we've just been discussing. It was the stage ones that were, were the problem, really, where, um, um, you know, we, it had to be more than 50 percent probable that the individual had received NHS blood or blood products uh, at a time when um, uh, medical records uh, were, were often not available. Uh, we went to extremely um, to, to extreme ends to to try and provide, um, even before the appeal panel were involved, uh, evidence to suggest that they they uh, that, that they had received a blood transfusion. Um, but that was a soft process uh, made a lot worse by the fact that um, I think after seven years um, most records were no longer available in general, not just in this setting. Um, 
And um, so, um, for instance, if you've been involved in a road accident uh, and your pelvis had been fractured or one of the long bones of the leg uh, had been uh, fractured, uh, it was likely that you'd, you'd be having uh, more, more than two units of blood. So um, I, I went online and, and asked the question of how many patients um, you know, who have been involved uh, in a road accident and have fractured their pelvis would receive a blood transfusion. And there's a, a nice study in that showing that virtually everybody did. So we were able to say anybody uh, with the scars showing that they'd had um, uh, a fracture of the femur or, or, or uh, uh, a historical evidence that they'd had a fractured pelvis, when we could say that that would be taken as evidence. So we're trying to build a case um, to, to help those um, that had uh, a, uh, who were putting in a stage one application uh, at a time when they couldn't actually lay hands on notes really. Uh, and um, Jeff and I, Jeff Tushaker and I often um, met to see, think of uh, ways in which we could do that. Um, for instance, taking photographs to see what, what sort of operation they had had. Um, it might seem strange, but patients actually went along with that and sent a, a picture to show that they, they had had a caesarean section where quite a few patients would, uh, would have a blood transfusion and these sort of issues, really. And I'll come back to stage one. Um, if we go over the page whilst we're on this document, we can then pick up stage, the... Stage two, then, specifically. We, uh, we did manage to get that down to a very good uh, level of acceptability and with very few um, appeals overturning. And, and then we can see the discussion in the t t long top paragraph on this page, um, further discussion about fibrous scan reading. So it says, uh, Professor Thomas reported he'd recently attended a British Association for the Study of the Liver slash British Society of Gastroenterology meeting about new HCV treatments, during which he summarised the Skipton Fund's assessment process for determining if cirrhosis was probable for the stage two payment. The data supported a fibro scan score of 14.5 as an indicator of a greater than 50% probability of cirrhosis in the absence of other markers. At the meeting, the clinicians had recommended a fibroscan score for advanced fibrosis of 11.5, which was lower than that used for Skipton Fund Stage 2 assessments, as they wanted to make sure the sensitivity for offering treatments was high, although a, uh, over 80%, although a good approach from a treatment point of view is it limited the chance of missing a patient with cirrhosis. From the fund's point of view, it would mean that the cirrhosis would be overestimated in many cases. Professor Thomas would make the Department of Health aware of this difference in approach and that unless requested otherwise, the fund would continue to consider applications for evidence of a greater than 50% probability of cirrhosis. Now this, um, if we just go back up the page so we can see the whole of that first paragraph shown it. Thanks. Th this would tend to suggest that by this stage, March 2015, the Skipton Fund was using 14.5 um, uh, uh, fibre scan score as, as its indicator of a probability of cirrhosis, whereas what we'd looked at previously suggested it was going to be lower than that. C can, can you assist us with understanding the position? Uh, I mean, it, we did uh, move it downwards. There's no doubt about that. And uh, um, I think uh, we alighted on 12. No, um, and that was principally because Ishak 5, which is just pre-cirrhotic, and um, uh, Ishak 6, which is cirrhosis, um, are not that dif different even uh, at a biopsy level. And um, I was concerned that, um, and I think I, uh, I, think I included a, a, a one stage, when we were doing serial fibro scans, it was apparent that some patients were moving from the pre-serotic to a serotic stage, and pre-serosis would be five to cirrhosis at six. Um, and once the, you have cirrhosis, as I mentioned earlier, then uh, you, if, even if the virus is cleared, you don't go back to lower levels of fibrosis and ultimately to normal. Whereas if you're treated at Ishak 5 and you get rid of the virus, the liver goes back to complete normality. Um, and we were seeing uh, patients who were having serial um, scans um, who were moving from four or five up to six uh, when, um, you know, d during a period of a year, there were 90 cases that I, I wrote to the, or brought to the attention of the Department of Health. 
And of course, when, when it got to six and they had cirrhosis, then they would be at risk of developing primary liver cell cancer. So I felt uncomfortable watching this. And this was at the stage when these new drugs came in, which were virtually 100% effective. So I thought we should be giving um, these new drugs uh, to people in the pre-serotic stage, uh, ISHAC-5, rather than waiting till they had um, cirrhosis. Uh, um, um, and um, the Department of Health had already decided that patients with cirrhosis would get these drugs uh, uh, before it had been considered by NICE. And I think they made provision for 500 people to get this. But I wanted to include, for the reasons I've just, just said, that uh, ISHAC-5 should be included. Um, and um, that, that didn't come about uh, because, um, oh, I don't know why, it wasn't my decision, but uh, I wrote to the minister saying I thought we should do this and, uh, and it didn't come about. So, uh, but that's why, because that was going on in the background, I thought we should be moving down to um, uh, a fibro scan score of about 12, really, because it, we would then be including quite a few of these ishak fives if you like it was a covert way of getting these patients into the scheme this this document reads as though um the score that was as a matter of fact being used by the skipton fund was 14.5 is it your recollection that that's not correct then um i can't really remember to be honest i, I remember the meeting where we uh, uh, with the British Society of Gastroenterology, whether we did come on to this, uh, you know, this figure of 14.5. But I think it's recorded somewhere. We did decide to, to use it, uh, use the figure of 12 in the Skipton. Um, so, um, and for the reason I've just said, I thought that it was better to include those slightly lower levels because we might pick up some that were going to progress to six in the very short term, namely the next year. It, it might depend upon the, the quality of the person who took the, the minutes, or the quality of the minutes, rather, because uh, the reference to the data supported uh, a fibro scan score might not be the conclusion of Professor Thomas. It might be his report of what the British Association made of the data. Possibly. In, in context. It, it's uh, not so clear. It, it's, it's not entirely clear. Which, which is the reason for asking the question, sir. Yes, well, obviously. The documentation doesn't, I think, provide a clear answer. Um, but Professor, do you know whether the Skipton Fund published um, uh, anything about what its approach to fibre scan scores was so that clinicians would know whether um, it, it was worth assisting their patients to make an application to the Skipton Fund on the basis of a fibre scan result or not? I, I can't recall uh, whether we did or, or didn't really. Certainly that uh, the British Association for the Study of the Liver, um, BSG, um, did, uh, that, that was uh, published. I mean, the, the BSG and EASL uh, and the, the British Association always published their, um, their meetings. Um, because the British Society of Gastroenterology um, owned gut, and they tended to put these sort of policy decisions in, into gut so that everybody could see it. Um, but uh, it was a contentious issue, really, uh, not just from the point of view of whether patients uh, should get a, a, an ex gratia payment, but as I mentioned before, when patients were um, deemed to have um, um, cirrhosis, they are at risk 2 to 4% per year, of developing primary liver cell cancer, and that requires that they have some form of imaging, usually an ultrasound, but possibly a CT scan or an MR scan, uh, so that the tumor is picked up at a stage when we could resect it or, or recommend the patient for a liver transplant. So there were, so that m meeting at the BSG um, was also um, subserving that function. It wasn't. Uh, uh, it wasn't um, uh, purely on the issue of. Um, you know, whether the Skipton uh, stage two payments would be triggered. Um, and um, um, uh, Professor Mutimer, of course, um, actually he was on the appeal panel at that stage, was he not? Yes. Yes, uh, I think he, he um, was, 
he he was very keen to be as precise as possible, really. And uh, I was a little bit more on the uh, on the side of sort of saying, well, it's going to be in the patient's benefit uh, to go for a slightly lower level, uh, which is why I, I thought we agreed on twelve in the end. But that what has agreed at this meeting is one thing, but what Skipton decided to do, uh, which I'm surprised can't be found. I would hope it could be found somewhere in the minutes of various Skipton uh, uh, meetings. I'm pretty sure we uh, agreed with 12. But Professor Dushaker might be able to help there. Th thank you, and we'll, we'll, we'll check that. Um, yeah, because he might recall better than I can. Andre. Um, I want to go back then on, on a different issue to the previous set of minutes we looked at. So that's SKIP 5030 underscore 085. So this is the March 2013 meeting, your first meeting as director again. Um, um, if we look now at the second page. It's important to say a director, by the way, because yes. we had group responsibility. Yes. I think you're promoting me to a level that I didn't attain. As Peter Stevens was the director, or the chairman of the directors, yes. really, is what I should say. Um, if we look at the bottom of the page, we can see that the board considered um, here the issue of stage two applications from the estates of people who were co-infected with hepatitis C and HIV, who died before the 29th of August 2003 and whose records have been destroyed. And then we see the scheme administrator, Mr Fish, reporting there have been a number of stage two applications from the estates of people who died and whose records have now been destroyed. In many cases, it was apparent that the family member, most often a widow, distinctly recalled that the deceased had been diagnosed with cirrhosis. But because of the lack of records, the application had been declined some of these cases were also declined by the appeal panel, which had then undertaken extensive research into the matter, and, and then as a reference to um, a suggestion by Dr. Mutimer. And then it's the next paragraph I wanted to ask you about. It says, after further meetings and research and with the help of Professor Thomas, a model had been created based on average fibrosis progression rates in people who were mono-infected with hepatitis C and co-infected with hepatitis C and HIV. The scheme administrator summarised the model, the values and dates that have been used and the reasons why these figures have been used. Around 40 declined applications from the estates of co-infected people would need reviewing on the basis of this model. Um, what, can you assist us, because I don't think we have the underlying model itself, um, with what this model was and, and, and what it told you and how it was used? Um. I, I can't remember a heck of a lot about this, I'm afraid. They, they, um, there, were, um, there was a paper produced, uh, and I think Professor Jushaker was involved with this, plus one of the Cambridge mathematical modelers. And the focus was to uh, look at people with hepatitis C mono-infection as opposed to those uh, with hepatitis C and HIV. And um, <coughs> that... Uh, that allowed us to to come up with a formula, really, for 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 saying that um, depending whether they had the mono infection or the dual infection, um, what would be the probability in the absence of a post mortem that that patient had cirrhosis? Um, um, I, I could look up the papers again, uh, um, but um, that was essentially the summary. I can't remember, uh, you know, what the detail of the formula was. But, um, and that did uh, mean that we could uh, say with a reasonable probability, the magical greater than 50% uh, probability that, that the patient had a cirrhosis uh, and, and had died uh, and, uh, um, and no post-mortem being done, of course, uh, which in, in the case of HIV co-infected individuals, um, there was a reluctance to do this. Uh, so it was required that we should have some sort of model. Um, I can't really say anything uh, more about the detail of it, but I could look it up in due course if you wanted. Thank, thank you. Um, I think we understand from other documents it, it, it's, um, it's described as um, giving rise to predictive formula for progression to cirrhosis. Um, yes. And so the aim was to, to ap 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 apply it, whatever precisely it looked like, to the cases of those who were dead and for whom no records or no relevant records existed to work out what the probability was that they would have progressed to cirrhosis 
well, by the time they died. Is that right? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. The, the bird's just banging on the window, so I was got distracted there. <laughs> so would you mind saying that again? It, it, yes. Um, it, it was, as, as, as we understand it, a, um, a, a predictive formula. That's how it's described in other Skipton documents for progression to cirrhosis. Um, and so whatever yes. the precise data um, um, was, it perhaps doesn't matter for present purposes, it was then applied to work out what the pros probability was that someone for whom, who's dead, for whom there are no records or relevant tests, would have progressed to cirrhosis. Correct. Um, so I know, Tom, I'm going to move on to, to stage one applications in a little more detail now, so perhaps this is a good moment for a break. Yes, well, we'll, we'll take a, a, a break and until quarter to 12. It'll allow you to, to get some, some refreshment, uh, Professor, uh, and uh, those who want to do the same. So quarter to 12. And so I can't remember whether you gave yes, Professor I, Thomas I the, the warning. Um, so let me just um, tell you what the, the rules are. Uh, you, you must not, during the, this break or any other break that we may have, discuss with anyone the evidence you have given or the evidence that you are yet potentially to give. Um, you can discuss that after you've finished your evidence, but not before. Uh, but in the meantime, you can just talk about anything else you like. Quarter to twelve.